Good morning. Bon dia. Sac passe. Ma boule. Oh, buenos dias. Okay, I know I forgot somebody. Buenos dias. Uh, let me just say something. You know, uh, it's a privilege to have with us trophies of God's grace. And uh, when we look around the sanctuary and stuff, I, I can literally, I could stand up right now and pull out, pick up, have people stand up and, and just point out trophies of God's miraculous grace. You know, Pastor Gary is a trophy of God's grace. I don't know if he's still in here. <laughs> Pastor Gary, Pastor Gary, if you looked with world's eyes at that man 30 years ago, you would never imagine in your wildest imaginations where he is today and what he's accomplishing for God today. If you, same thing with Brother Anthony, same thing with Ronnie, same thing with so many of our church family. You know, uh, these guys have gone through Teen Challenge, and, and it's impacted their lives. And I just want to say this. I, I'm, I'm so glad that Anthony was able to be with us. He went, he, he went with me down to Broken Chains Biker Church on Friday night. He shared down there as well. And uh, he'll be with us. Uh, we have a minister's fellowship in here on, uh, at, at Victory on Tuesday, and he'll be back. But let me just say something. There are two major projects that they need to finish up. One is the water project there in, uh, for, the men, for the men's home, and the other is for the girls' home in, um, uh, to finish off those bedrooms. If, if God puts it on your heart and you say, you know what, Pastor Lou, I'd like to give so much or just a little bit or whatever, uh, if you, if, if you want to give, come see me because I can get it to him. He's going to drive. Get this. This is what he does every year to, to help continue to fund the program down there. He comes up here during February. Can you imagine leaving Jamaica in February? And he comes up here, and he, then he, he, didn't just, like, he didn't just come here to be with us. He's here. Then he's driving this afternoon to New York and then to Albany, New York, then driving from Albany, New York tomorrow to Utica, New York to meet there, then driving all the way back over here to be here on on uh, Tuesday, and then he's driving to, all the way to Virginia, and then back up to Washington, D.C., and then back up to New York. He's traveling around like that because that's his commitment to the things that God is calling him to do in, at, in Jamaica. And, you know, we've got some Jamaica folks here in our church. Uh, I don't know, is, is anybody seen Jennifer? There she is. She's all the way in the back there. And I know there's some others, but Jennifer Chambers Roberts. Make sure you, you see him afterwards. Come and see me if God puts it on your heart and you want to give a little bit extra today. Um, there was a famous British art, artist who lived in the 1800s. His name was Dante Rossetti. And Dante Rossetti was, became a very, very famous, he was not just a, he was a poet as well, poet uh, and artist. And at one point in his, towards the end of his life, he was approached by an elderly man and this man had some sketches and drawings that he wanted the famous artist to look at to tell him if they were any good. And so uh, he, he just wanted to see, is there any potential in these drawings? And so Rossetti began to look through his, this portfolio, and he's going through it. He, after the first three or four pictures, he knew that there was, there was no, no good artistic qualities to them. These paintings, the, or these right, uh, drawings were worthless. But he wanted to at least be kind to the man, and, and so he told the elderly gentleman as, as, as gently as he possibly could that these pictures are, were of no value and they showed very little talent. The visitor was quite disappointed. This old man was disappointed. But Rossetti could tell in the way he took that news that he was expecting that judgment. He then apologized for taking up so much of Rossetti's time and he, and he asked the, the famous artist, he said, would you be willing just to look at a few more drawings by a younger artist? And so Rossetti said, sure, I'll, I'll do that for you. And he began to look at the set, second portfolio of, from this younger artist, and he became very enthusiastic about this talent that, he, that they revealed. He said, these, these, th these are the works of a great artist. 
He said, this young student has great talent and, and he should be given every help in or, and every encouragement in his career to be able to become a great artist. He has a great future if he will work, and st- work hard and stick to it. Rossetti could see that the old man was deeply moved. He said, who is this, this young artist? Is this your son? And the old man said, no, no, it's not my son. He said, it's actually me. 40 years ago. If only I had heard your encouragement back then, but I got disappointed and I gave up too soon. We're continuing our teaching series this morning entitled Barnabas, Son of Encouragement. And last week we started this character study on the, on the life of one of the most influential Christian leaders in early church history, Barnabas. Barnabas was a prominent character in the New Testament early church. His given name was Joseph, but when he became involved with the apostles, they changed his name. They gave him a nickname, and they called him Bar Nabas, which translated means son of encouragement. During this study, we will examine the various ways that Barnabas encouraged people, and I trust that through this study, each one of us that are here we'll learn and discover new ways that we can encourage those that are around us. Last week, we talked about Barnabas, the encouraging giver. If you missed that sermon, you can go on to our website, victorychurchma.com, click the link that says uh, media, and that'll take you to a page where you can fo- watch the current message series. So Barnabas was an encouraging giver. And the title of my message this morning and the thing that I want to talk about was Barnabas this morning. Barnabas the encouraging inviter, the encouraging inviter. Look at your neighbor and say, the inviter. According to early church traditions that are, that are not recorded in the Bible, this is not recorded in the Bible, but early church history uh, and, and tradition says that Barnabas was actually the student of a very famous rabbi named Gamaliel. He was also Paul the Apostle's teacher. And Barnabas and Paul may have actually been classmates, though Barnabas was probably a few years uh, advanced from him. Tradition says that Barnabas became a follower of Jesus and actually accompanied Jesus on his Galilean tours as he wandered around from from town to town in Upper Galilee, and uh, Barnabas was there with him. Tradition goes on to say that Jesus chose Barnabas to become one of the 70 apostles that he sent out on mission in Luke chapter 10. You can read that story there. And the tradition continues and says that Barnabas's first converts were his cousin, Mary, who lived in Jerusalem, and her, her son, John Mark. Some scholars believe that he probably, because uh, Paul was, was his classmate, was a, 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 another rabbi who had tra- been trained under the same rabbi, that he probably went and, and spoke this message of Jesus being the Messiah to Paul the Apostle. Only Paul rejected his message and instead began to persecute the followers of Jesus. Acts chapter 7, Paul begins this this, uh, uh, persecution of the saints. And Acts chapter 7 tells us the story of the first martyr, the first person who died for Jesus, for their testimony. His name was Stephen. And Stephen was a preacher of the gospel, but his message that Jesus was the Messiah infuriated the Jews, the religious Jews. And at the end of Acts chapter 7, it says that the Jews picked up stones off of the ground, and they began to throw stones at Stephen until they they killed him. And at the beginning of Acts chapter 8, we see something, there's uh, just a phrase, three verses here that are so important. And it says this, get this. Acts chapter 8, 1 through 3, it says, And Saul was there. That's Saul, Paul, the Apostle Paul. His, his Jewish name was Saul. His Greek name was Paul. It's the same person. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. The actual Greek word says, it says that he cast his vote against them. He was there casting his vote against Stephen. And so he was there, and later on in in the book of Acts, we find out that he was holding the coats of the men who were doing the stoning of Stephen. And it says, and so he was giving approval of Stephen's death, and on that day, the persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. 
and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And then it says godly men came and took the body of, of, of Stephen and buried him, but mourned for him deeply. But then, get this, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison, it says. Saul begins, this, this, this man begins to persecute the church. A great persecution breaks out over all the church. And the Jerusalem church, the saints, are being dragged out of their houses and, and put into prison. And, and because of that, many of them began to flee Jerusalem, and they started leaving and going all over. Well, what happens is Saul ends up going to the high priest and saying, look, you know what, we want to stop these followers of Jesus because there's no way that Jesus could be the Messiah. He can't be the Son of God. He can't be the Savior of, of, of the world. And so he gets letters from the high priest and gets authority to go. And, and where, the, where the believers began to scatter, he was going to go and start collecting them there and dragging him them back to Jerusalem to imprison them as well. And so Acts chapter 9 tells a story of when Paul went to Damascus to persecute the believers there. And his plan was to go into the town and round up the followers of Jesus and lead them back in chains to Jerusalem. But something happened on the road to Damascus that changed everything. Acts chapter 9 verses 3 through 8, it records the story and it says this, As Paul neared Damascus on his journey... Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. He said, I am Jesus who you're persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless, it says, because they heard the sounds but they didn't see anyone. I kind of makes I, I kind of laugh when I when I read that because it kind of reminds me of. Do you remember? Do you remember the Peanuts cartoon? You remember Snoopy the the old and you remember when Peppermint Patty was in class and and Charlie Brown was in class and the teacher would talk and the teacher was going wah 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 wah. Well. They heard the sound, but they didn't understand. They couldn't understand what, what was happening. Here is Jesus. Jesus appears to, to Saul, and he begins to speak to Saul. He says, why are you persecuting me? You get up and go into town, and, and you're going to find out what you're supposed to do. And those guys that are with him, are, are Paul standing there. He's, he's like on the ground, like probably freaking out that he's, he's not dead. And, and, and these guys are looking around. Paul sees flashing light. But he, they don't see anything. Paul sees Jesus and they don't see anything. And who's Paul talking to? He says, get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. And so verse 8, Saul got up from the ground. But when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. And so they led him by the hand into Damascus. That just is so ironic. Because Paul came... He came from Jerusalem to go to Damascus and take, the, take the, the, the believers in Jesus prisoner, wrap them in chains, and lead them by the hand back to Jerusalem to go to prison. And now, here's Paul, who thought he was enlightened, now blind, being led into Damascus by the hand. Isn't that awesome? God's pretty cool, isn't he? Through this experience, Paul got saved. The Bible tells us that he stayed in Damascus for several days and he began preaching, immediately began preaching in the synagogue in Damascus that Jesus was the Son of God. Nobody could believe that the chief persecutor of the church had now become its chief promoter. Paul then went back to Jerusalem and the story continues in verse 26 of chapter 9. It says this, when he came to Jerusalem... Get this, this is awesome. He came to Jerusalem and he tried to join the disciples. But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. The believers in Jerusalem, in the Jerusalem church, they didn't believe that Paul had actually gotten saved. They didn't believe that he was a, a, a true convert. They thought maybe he was faking it so that he could infiltrate their ranks and destroy the church. And in Acts chapter 9 
verse 27, it continues and it, it says this. Listen to this. Now, you got to think about this. Here's Paul comes back to Jerusalem. And he's in the marketplace. And he sees some, some people in the marketplace. And he says, excuse me, could you tell me where's the, where, where's the local church meeting? You know, those believers are like, why would I know? How would I know? I don't know anything about it. And they're scurrying away. And he goes to somebody else, excuse me, can you tell me, where's the church? Where's the believers meeting? Can you take me to the apostles? We don't know anything about it. And they're out of there. Why? Because they were afraid for their lives. But verse 27 says this, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them, he told the apostles how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. After Paul had gotten saved on the road to Damascus, everybody in Jerusalem avoided him out of fear. But Barnabas went to meet Paul. Even when everyone else was afraid to approach him, he went. Think about the amount of courage that that must have taken to go, to go see him. Can I tell you something? When you invite and you welcome people into the church, you're encouraging them to be included in the great things that God is doing. Barnabas took Paul and he brought him to the apostles. Barnabas literally stood up for him. He, he went and he met Paul and then, then he hears Paul's story and then he goes to the apostles and he vouches for Paul. Barnabas invited and welcomed Paul into the church. Barnabas was an encouraging inviter. And there are two important qualities that can be seen in people who are like Barnabas. First, encouraging inviters affirm people. To affirm someone means to speak positively on their behalf. By inviting Paul into the church family, Barnabas was affirming who Paul was and the call that he claimed to have on his life by Jesus. Can I tell you something? So many people have grown up without any kind of affirmation in their lives. There are kids that have grown up all of their lives and they've only been told that they are stupid or that they're worthless or that they'll never amount to anything. That's debilitating to a child. Affirming people goes against our norm, really, because most people are only looking out for number one. They're looking for the affirmation that they can get to make themselves feel better. But as believers, we are to look out for others around us. Barnabas took a risk in bringing Paul to the apostles. See, if, if Paul was just faking it, if he was faking his conversion and, and really wanted to still kill the church, then Barnabas was taking a huge risk. Why? Because he would be the first one captured and killed. And secondly, he would expose the apostles to being murdered as well. See, some people think that other people deserve affirmation only after they've earned it. What's interesting here is that at this point in church history, Paul hadn't done anything to earn affirmation. See, he went on to become one of the most impactful leaders in church history, but up to this point, his whole mission was to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. He even admits this when he calls himself the chiefest of sinners. I'm the worst sinner that there is. He didn't deserve any kind of welcome, especially a welcome into the church. But Barnabas gives Paul what he didn't deserve. Folks, that's what is called grace. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? See, God and Jesus gave us what we didn't deserve, acceptance into eternal life. Grace is God giving you something you don't deserve. You didn't earn it, but he gives it to you anyway. That's his grace. And God in Jesus has given us what we didn't deserve, eternal life. Can I tell you something? A grace-filled life affirms others, even those who haven't earned it. 
encouraging inviters affirm others, and, and people who have experienced affirmation actually accomplish much more than those who have never experienced affirmation in their lives. You just look at Paul. Years, years later, Paul went on and he wrote 13 of the New Testament books. 13 of our books in the New Testament writings were written by Paul the Apostle, including Romans, which if you read Romans chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, Paul says this, he goes on and he says this, We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. It's, it's hard. It's, it's not hard to affirm somebody, folks. Really, all you have to do is you have to look at somebody and say, man, I'm glad you came to Victory Church today. I'm so glad. I know God has a great plan for your life. Or, hey, brother, listen, let me pray for you. What is your need today? That's the encouragement that some people, that's all they need. And it makes a huge difference in their lives. Barnabas invited and welcomed Paul into the church. The second important quality that can be seen in people who are like Barnabas is that encouraging inviters believe in people. They believe in people. See, nobody trusted Paul at first. Why? Because trust is not easily gained. But with Barnabas' help, Paul overcame his trust issue. And Barnabas saw Paul's potential for the kingdom of God, and he went and invited Paul to become a part of the, the, that Jerusalem church. See, he, he looked at Paul's potential. He believed that Paul had great potential for God. Folks, when you look at people, do you see their potential or just where they're at right now? If you would have looked at my life at 16 years old, you would have thought, this kid is a waste. There's nothing there. There's nothing of great value there in his life. He's throwing it away. But an encourager looks past the faults of an individual and sees what they might become for God's kingdom. That's the way that God looks at us. That's the way that God sees us. See, he looks at us and he doesn't see the mess that we've made of our lives. He sees the potential that is within us. When you look at people, you need to see their potential. And when you're seeing their potential, you're seeing the way that God sees. I remember I was probably 19 years old. I was saved for about a year. And I began playing with this band called Wings of Praise. And we traveled all over the Northeast region of the United States. And, and, and we ended up with a concert in inner city Waterbury, Connecticut. And, and Waterbury at that time it was a lot of drugs. There was a lot of, uh, you know, just a, a lot of violence in the, the area. And uh, I remember uh, what, what we used to do is we would go out on the streets and we would be given flyers with the information of the concert, trying to get people to the concert the, that night. And so they, they gave me a stack of flyers and said, okay, Lou, this is your area. You're going to take from this street to this street, and we want you to pass out these flyers and tell everybody about the concert. And then if you get to talk to them about the Lord, that's cool. So I, I get out, and I'm, me and another guy, we're starting to pass out flyers, and people are walking away from me, you know, and you know how people, you ever have anybody downtown, they're trying to give you, a, 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 you know, a, a, an advertisement or something like that, what do you do? You kind of like ignore that, you, you don't even see them, they're over here, and you're like, you know, you know how you do it, done. you all have done it, don't, don't act like you didn't do it, we all do it, you know, you know what I do, because sometimes you get the, you get the people who call, you, you, anybody get the, the, phone, the phone calls, the, 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 the calls? And they, come, they come in and they go, congratulations. And it's, it's always a recorded line. Congratulations. You have won such and such. And if you press one now, we'll transfer you to an operator, you know? Well, I never press one. I press zero. I press zero because when you press zero, it gives you a live person. Sometimes. It'll give you a live person. Now I get the Chinese. Do you get the Chinese ones like that? It's, it's, it's in Chinese, and they, they're calling. I don't know why they call me, but they, I, I got to call the Chinese. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how to speak Chinese, but yeah, yeah. And, 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 and so I press zero. I press zero, and, and then somebody goes, hello? And I say, I say yes, 
I said, did you know that Jesus Christ died for your sins? And they're like, what? what? Hello? And I said, I said he came to earth and, and, and is God, and he died on the cross so that you can know him. You need to surrender your life to Jesus. I start preaching, and they hang up on me. <laughs> Listen, you do it a few times, and they'll take you off the list. They'll take your... They won't call you no more. I figure you're going to get my time. I'm taking some of your time as well and giving it, giving it to God, okay? Anyways, I'm on the streets passing out these things, you know, and, and everybody's walking past me and ignoring me or pushing me out of the way. You know, it was a rough neighborhood. And, and then there was a guy, I look over and there's a bar there on the, on the one side, the one end of the street, there's this bar, and there's a, a giant Harley Davidson in the front of the bar, right? This big black motorcycle. And I love motorcycles, and I, I rode for years, so I, I'm like drawn to it, but there's a guy leaning up against it, you know? And this guy is like six foot three, jacked, just ripped, with tattoos all over his, and he's got, his arms are, are bare, you know, he's got just a, a leather vest on with some motorcycle club on the back, and he's there just tatted up, and, he's, and long blonde hair. You know, and he's standing there against the bike like this, and his muscles just look, and I was just like, oh, my God. It looked like, I thought it was Dog the Bounty Hunter. You know, that's what it looked like. And, and, I, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, man. He, you know, and I'm just like, okay, I'm going to go give him one of these. I'm going to go invite him to the thing. I said, excuse me, sir? <laughs> eh. uh, he's like, what do you want? I said, like, I want to invite you to a concert, you know, and. And I hand it to him, and he takes the paper, and he looks down at it, and he just kept looking at it, and he just started shaking his head like this. And I went, oh, man, uh, uh, you know, and he looked at me, and he goes, do you know the neighborhood that you're in? And I'm like, yes. He goes, you know, this is a bad neighborhood, right? I said, yes. He goes, he goes, you know, you shouldn't be here at all, and you definitely shouldn't be handing these stupid things out. I said, yes. He goes, well, why are you doing it? I said, because Jesus sent me here, God sent me here to, to tell people about Jesus. And he just sat there for a minute, kind of like puzzled. And, and, he, and he just like, was almost like I punched him in the face or something. Because God sent me here to tell people about Jesus. And he goes, well, if God sent you here, then I'm going to make sure that you get the job done. And he stands up and he starts walking around with me. And, and I'm passing out all these papers, you know, and, you know, people are like, Walking by, you know, they're doing that deal, and they're trying, and he's grabbing them. He goes, "Take the paper, <laughs> take the paper," and and they're going, they're going, "Yes, sir," you know, and okay, I'll take three, you know, <laughs> you know, and they're going off, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm feeling like eight foot tall, you know, I'm like, so I'm on the one corner, and there's a bodega on the corner, you know, and and I'm on the corner, and I'm passing out all these papers to everybody in there, and the guy is going, "Take it, take the paper, take the paper." And, and the, the guy whose corners was a drug dealer, and he's this, this little poor, he was little, I could have taken him, even without the guy. But, but he come out with a cane in his hands, you know, and, and he comes like bebopping out, and he goes, what are you doing on my corner? And, and he starts calling me names, and he starts poking me with the, with the thing. And at this point, the, the biker had walked down a little bit, down the street a little bit, and he, this guy's poking me with the thing. And I'm like, oh man, this guy's going to hit me with this stick. And, and he goes, this is my corner. Don't you ever come on this corner. You don't come on this corner. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I felt like something behind me. And I saw the Puerto Rican dude go like this. And I knew that it was the biker there. I said, you got something to say to me, pal? <laughs> the guy went, no. And he went right back into the bodega. I passed out those flyers in record time, man. It was awesome. And do you know that that dude, he came on that night, he came to the concert that night, and at the concert, he, he actually, I said, I said, hey, man, I, I think his name was Vic. I said, hey, Vic, man, I'm glad you're here. He goes, yeah, he goes, I'm your security. I'm like, <laughs> yes, sir. Can I tell you something? I'll never forget walking up to him, shaking, my knees shaking, because I was looking with earthly eyes. I wasn't looking at what God saw. I wasn't looking at, at, at the potential for God's kingdom that this man had. 
I want to encourage you. Don't look at people with the eyes of the flesh. So you need to ask God to give you his eyes to see people. Eyes that see kingdom potential and not fleshly problems. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20, it says this, that God is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us. God wants to do immeasurably more in people's lives than we could have ever dreamed or imagined. When you look at them, you say, oh yeah, oh, you know, sometimes we look at young kids and we go, oh, someday they're going to make a great preacher. Someday they're going to be a missionary. Someday, but we don't do that with one another. When you see somebody whose life is broken, do you ever say that? But what imagine, just imagine what God could do if they surrender their lives. See, God wants to do immeasurably more in people's lives than we could ever dream or imagine. We need to develop the ability to believe in people whose lives seem unbelievable to us. I want you to know something. Barnabas did a lot of great work for the kingdom of God. Barnabas, Barnabas gave great finances. He was a great giver. He went to the Antioch church and helped them establish their church. He was a, a church builder. Then he went out with Paul the apostle and he became a church planter. And then he, he was a, a, a messenger. And I believe that Barnabas, it was Barnabas who actually wrote the book of Hebrews. That's what I believe. Nobody knows for sure. But can I tell you something? None of those things equal the one thing that he did. See, his, Barnabas' greatest impact on the kingdom of God was not something that God did through him, but what God did through Paul the Apostle, a man who he encouraged. Christianity is all about investing in other people. It's not about us. It's not about what I get. It's about what I give away. So this week, as we close, I'm going to give you an assignment. Your assignment is very simple, to find somebody this week that you can affirm. Find somebody this week who you can say, you know what, I believe in you. I believe that God's got greater things for your life than you have ever dreamed or imagined. And I can tell you something, that's prophetic. When you look at somebody, you tell them that, that's prophetic. That speaks into their lives. God's got a plan for me. Negative, negativity comes easy, but we need to be practicing encouragement. Let's stand together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Lord, we come before you right now. We thank you, God, for the opportunity that we have to open up your word and to see what it speaks to us and how it applies to our lives today. God, we ask in the name of Jesus that, Father, we wouldn't just be believers who go about our own business, always looking out for our own interests. But, Lord, that we would, God, that we would make it a point to be looking for people who, God, have great potential for your kingdom. And as, as you begin to reveal to us the things that you want to do in them, help us to be affirming of them. Help us to be standing with them and believing in them, Lord. God, we pray that this specific week, Lord, that each one of us would even right now, that you would put in our minds that one person that we are to affirm and that one person who we're supposed to believe in and we're supposed to speak to and encourage and, and become that inviter, that welcomer for your kingdom. So Lord, I ask God in the name of Jesus that you would help, Lord, that the spirit of encouragement would be something that permeates this body of believers. That each one of us, God, that we will, we will be encouragement to every single person that we come in contact with. We thank you for that. We bless you, Lord. I'm going to ask the prayer partners to come and just make a line across the front right now, real quick, if you would come forward. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want you to know that we believe in you. We believe that God can do so much in your life. You know why we know that? You know why we believe it? Because he's done it in us. If you look at Brother Anthony, you can talk to him. He'll be in the foyer afterwards. Ask him about his testimony. You can talk to me. You can talk to others. Pastor, Pastor Eduardo, you can talk to Pastor Gary. Talk to us. The things that God has done in us. Our lives were unbelievable for those that, that would have seen us back then. 
but all it took was a few people speaking belief into our lives. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, I want to encourage you to come and talk to one of these prayer partners today. Come up and pray with them. Spend some time and just tell them, I want Jesus in my life. I want to surrender my life to Christ. If you're here and you need that, you come and talk to one of the prayer partners. If you're here today and you have a healing need that you need in your body, if you have an unsaved loved one, if you have an emotional need, if there's financial, whatever is going on, whatever stresses, whatever situations you're facing, don't leave here the same way that you came in. God wants to meet you. He wants to, 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 to touch you. And so our prayer partners are here this morning to do that. In a minute, we're going to close in a word of prayer. And, and, and as we leave, you just feel free to go. Uh, be respectful that there's still ministry going on. But, but if you want prayer, you come up then. So let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we just come before you right now. We thank you, Lord, for your hand in our lives. We thank you, God, for your blessings. We ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus that you would be with us today, that as we go out of this place, we will go empowered, God, by your spirit so that we could be a light to those that don't know you, that we would be an encouragement affirming those who may not have ever come to Christ, believing in, in those, believing the best, God, in those that we come in contact with, that you have great plans. It's not anything we can do, but what you can do in, in a person who, who's surrendered to you. God, help us, Father, to have your eyes to see and your heart to affirm. We thank you, God. Go with us now. And Lord, we pray, Father, specifically for Harriet, who's in the hospital. Lord, we ask, God, that you would raise her up off of that bed of affliction. God, bring healing to her body, Lord. We pray for her now. Lord, we pray for Vinny as well. Lord, you see him in the rehab. Touch him in his body, God. Strengthen him, Lord. Strengthen the hip that's, that's, that's broken. And then, then, Father, do your work on his kidneys. God, even bring, to, bring him to a place where those kidneys begin to work again. Lord, we pray, Father, for those that are struggling with cancer here, for those that are struggling with hernias, Lord. God, bring healing over their bodies, Lord. We thank you, God, for what you're doing. Have your way, Lord. We give our church, this is your church, Lord, it's not ours. We give it to you, Lord. Have your way in each one of our lives. We bless you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you as you go. Have a great day. If you